we would like to welcome all of you to the WO38 pre-harvest Q&A. This meeting is different from the one that we had last week. Uh, in this case, we would like to encourage the conversation. So all of you are now muted and we will ask you to remain muted and unless you want to participate in the conversation, you can unmute yourself anytime and that would be the main goal of this meeting that we can have an open conversation and get a, as many participation as, as possible. If you see that we have any problems with the technology, uh, please send message through the chat box. Is it uh, if we lost connection or if there's a, a, a sound difficulties, please write that in the chat box. Also, if you don't want to ask questions live, you can write those questions in the chat box and Wendy Jones and Jenny Bolivar, they will be also tracking those questions and, and monitoring the, the, um, the sound and microphone so we can keep a good flow in the conversation. So what we have in the agenda is first of all to let you know that the video, the recording from last week's uh, meeting is already available in our TreeFruit webpage www.wsu.edu in the recent videos and also in the section where we have all the materials for WO38. This meeting is also being recorded and is going to be shared in our webpage and also in our uh, Fruit Matters edition for the next month. With that, I'm going to go with the agenda, the topics that we would like to talk uh, this afternoon is uh, all the issues regarding the production, pre-harvest condition, the crop, the crop load, volumes and yields, size of fruit, color, fruit finishing, weather and smoke impacts, and internal effects or disorders that we might be observing, diseases like green spot, for example, and other observations that you might have in your orchard. We would like to talk about the ripening and maturity at this, uh, at, up, up to this date, and harvest management, what to measure, how to measure, and different resources. So with that, we are ready to start the conversation. Please write your questions in the chat box and, and I can start asking, uh, what do you see in this season, 2020, in relation to crop volumes and yields? Okay, so to begin with, for the 2020 crop year, um, we have um, received an estimate from Washington State Tree Fruit Association of 1.622 million cartons. And recognizing that there was a significant windstorm that occurred um, in Washington State about two weeks ago. And so that number is likely going to be reduced. Um, we also have received some information from around the state that the uh, fruit size this year seems to be a bit smaller than it was in 2019 and with 2019's crop peaking on size uh, 64, 56, 48, um, that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, so, um, but we still have a little bit of time left for um, harvest to commence. So this could be um, uh, affected and changed as we approach the harvest state. And then the other point I wanted to bring out is that Although um, in IDEA, that's our um, database software program that we use to help manage this variety, um, there are 10.5 million trees that are, um, would be second leaf and older and are available to harvest in 2020. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that growers are going to harvest from all of those trees. A lot of people choose to defruit their second leaf trees. So um, those are the um, details that we have um, from PBM. Jill, so I do have a question. Do you see that this uh, reduced 
crop uh, is mainly due to the early conditions in the spring, the, the wind that we had at bloom time, or is uh, related to the smoke and other issues later in the season? Well, um, part of it was, um, and, and Stefano can probably speak more to this than I can, um, um, pollination would, would be a factor as well as there was some noticeable fruit drop um, at, at the time of set. And, and then also there would be um, an effect of the size of the fruit would um, also um, reduce the overall volume. So I do wonder, and this is a question for the growers, uh, what were the conditions that you had in, in your areas? Um, I can speak for the conditions that we had at the Rosa. At least we had a very good conditions for pollination, um, good weather. We, it seems that we had a lot of blooms. But one thing that we notice is that it bloom later than the pollinizers. And I don't know if this is a situation that you also experience in your, in your orchards. Yeah, I, I can add uh, something, Benedita, if you want. So we, we have a, a really good bloom in many places, but uh, was, uh, many of the flower was kind of uh, lateral flower. And uh, in some case they set, and um, and normally I don't see this kind of uh, set in in the lateral. So and this year they seems a little bit smaller compared the the normal. And uh, another things about the pollination that uh, um, to, I recommend usually to have more than one pollinator there. So because uh, it's a late bloom variety in some year. So and uh, we have uh, the bloom for us was April 18. And uh, right now the best result, at least in the project on pollination uh, that we are running is the snow drift seems really effective. Um, and, um, and Indian summer for the early part of the, of the bloom. And, and then the Mount Everest, uh, you know, that is important because it's also far blight uh, um, uh, tolerant and um, and and Granny's meat was also good as pollinizer. So we we test also Granny's meat and it seems uh, working well. And and blooming time is overlapping in 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 many cases. Yeah. So and and about the the the, the June drop this year was quite clear that there was a lot of fruit that uh, start but then many of them drop also large fruit uh, lateral large fruit drop and one thing that I, we noticed this year and is a uh, is kind of uh, we will present a report about that Sarah Sarah will present a report about that in many cases uh, this year there was not the king that sat but was one lateral. So it is a kind of weird situation. There is one fruit normally that go at the hand and sometimes it's the king. And we were thinking about always the king, but in some cases just one lateral if the king is not growing well. So quite normal, yeah. So do you think Stefano that we had a greater June drop this year? And if so, do you think, what were the conditions, why we had that greater June drop this year? Probably there was a lot of uh, fruit, small fruit, keep up. And this variety probably doesn't have the uh, capacity to load all those uh, uh, fruit and, uh, and they start to drop. So this is the kind of uh, thing that can be investigated, but for sure is a single so I, uh, I'm harvesting right now some fruit for some experiment, especially the pollination one. And it's really rare to find one that more than one fruit per cluster. You can see two, very rarely three, uh, uh, but uh, normally is a, is a single fruit. Yeah. There is a question, and, and I can just speak for the Rosa, about if this variety is more prone to mildew in general compared to other varieties? 
Do we have information about mildew susceptibility in COSPI? So we always see a lot of mildew in, uh, in, in, in Sunrise. So, and uh, probably with a, you know, kind of uh, uh, situation that can be related probably to vigor of the tree or something like that. So mildew can become aggressive. But in, in, I saw also in other orchards, but not like I saw in, in Sunrise. Okay, so, but I don't know in Rosa. So you have mildew there? Yes, and actually, uh, compared to other years, I think this year was uh, significantly higher. I don't have other varieties in the blog that we have at the Rosa, so I can't really talk about a uh, difference between varieties. So I, I wouldn't be able to say if this is more or less susceptible, but we did observe more mildew this year, especially the one that is in the shoot. Uh, the one that is it's been there throughout the winter and the shoot tip that becomes uh, in with the infection and very distinctive growth that is pale and and very white shoot tips and so that's that's the probably the biggest uh, pest or disease disease problem that we had at the rosa this year. So for for the those one that are growing was thirty eight that anyone want to share their experience uh, in terms of the what we've been talking about especially the volumes that you see in your orchards and June drop or also if you want to share about mildew susceptibility in your blocks. So we're going to move along and see, talk about the, um, the fruit size and, and color. What are we seeing today in terms of the fruit size in relation to other years? And so Jill already mentioned that the fruit size in, appears to be smaller this year, and that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Stefano, do you want to comment on the fruit size for this year and how yeah, so that relates to the conditions of... Um... Yeah, so, but uh, um, I, I think that uh, for, for, this is a variety that when it's not loaded, uh, you know, probably the fruit become really big, especially in, in young orchards. So, and, uh, in, in, and when you have probably uh, 30 to 40 fruit per tree is still uh, a larger fruit. When, when you load probably 50 to 70 to 80, probably the, you, you have a kind of uh, uh, reduction of a couple of sites. So and you are entering more, uh, you know, less uh, 48, 48 and, and, and 50, you know, four and a little bit smaller fruit. So what we, we saw this year, so is a kind of uh, uh, shutdown of the growth for a while when, uh, when, when there was the smoke. And depending on many days of smoke you have it, but uh, the, the the tree now are working normally, so the the, the growth is back. So in, in the data that I present last uh, time last week, there was just uh, four or five days where the growth significantly was reduced, almost zero. But now the the, the tree is working like uh, before, so uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. In some case, 0 0.4 millimeter per day of growth. That is what we are noticing right now. So, for those orchards that they only have the impact of the smoke, the fires was just the smoke and not the heat, uh, because we know that there were orchards that had the heat right next to them, and maybe that is a different effect of the smoke. But for those that only had the smoke in their orchard, Will you say that it's pretty much like the same effect you will have with a very cloudy days for a couple of days, or you think that there's something else that the smoke can can impact the fruit quality? I'm not so you you can have a reduction probably in photosynthesis, but uh, is um, is a, was a little bit higher than a cloudy day because uh, uh, we were measuring photosynthesis during the smoke. One of my students and. And there was around 600, 800. Uh, that is uh, more or less the same level that you need for, 
super saturate the, the, the photosynthesis activity and you don't need more than that. So, but the, the, the tree was not, uh, you know, working so well with the, with the condition. So in any case, it, yeah, unless you, you, you pointed out well that uh, depending where you are based on your orchard, if you got a really bad smoke, we got bad smoke for three, four days in, in this area. So, and, and we saw the, the, the impact on the tree, but uh, if people got longer time, so they can see a little bit more the things. But uh, the, the, this week, the tree is back on track. So from what I saw. Yes, I, I will agree with you, Stefano. In at the Rosa, at least, it seems that the, the fruit is catching up. It's getting good color. So one of the uh, things that I've observed in, in the growers that I have visited in the last couple of weeks uh, is this misshape that we talked last week, this fruit with the misshape, elongated, and sometimes uneven form. Uh, can any of you, Carolina, Stefano, or Ines, can comment on that? What, what are the causes of that? Uh, should we be worried about that? So we saw some misshapen this year, so in some fruit, uh, but is generally is related to pollination. So if you have an empty um, carpal, so there is no seed there, normally you, your fruit become, you know, misshapen. So, and, uh, and depending on how many seed you have inside in some cases. So also if you've got one, one carpal that is completely empty, it can be enough probably to make this uh, sharpie, you know, ending of the fruit on one side. So there is a comment here uh, about the rosy aphid caused some misshaping for them early, in, early on in the year. Um, we did, and probably, I don't know if we had more incidence of aphids, um, we did open some of those apples that were misshapen and we didn't see a difference in terms of the amount of seeds. Uh, at least in the, the, there were like three orchards that we, we've been visiting in the last couple of weeks and we opened this misshapen fruit and we didn't see a difference in um, the number of seeds. So I was uh, wondering if it could be something else, is an hormonal or like, um, uh, the comment in the chat box that is uh, the, an aphid that could cause the problem. We don't have this misshapen fruit as much as, as I have seen in younger orchards at the Rosa, so I can I really haven't follow up if it's related to an insect. Um, we didn't see that, but I've seen it in, in younger blocks where probably fourth leaf were in some cases, the, the amount of misshaped fruit was quite large. Ines, Carolina, have you have you seen? I have a question for Jill. So, uh, uh, which level of misshapen would be considered a cold? So. A very severe misshapen is a cold or not? Elongated, if symmetrical long elongation isn't a problem, but if you've got like a severe um, uh, missing side, missing missing uh, edge, then um, that should be um, a great downgraded. Um, we, we, we're looking for, especially in the premium grade anyway, we want some symmetrical look to the fruit. Um, I know Ines has um, observations on this topic. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't at this time. And my observations are mainly related to young fruit and that typically it's still the symmetrical shape, but it can be elongated or it also can be more um, uh, pushed together, I guess, flatter. Um, <laughs> Um, and this is typically related to younger trees um, and that that will uh, uh, disappear for the most part as the tree matures. But yes, we have seen early season insect damage 
uh, that sometimes can show up and can cause misshape. Um, that's that we have seen before as well. And in very rare cases, we also had seen uh, some sunburn damage um, that then can also cause the flattening of the um, of one side of the fruit. Uh, not so often, um, actually very rare uh, was the missing missing seeds in the seed cavity causing the misshape. Um, although that is of course possible, but in, in, in our experiments, we haven't seen that um, actually very often at all. So does uh, any of the growers that are in the meeting would like to share um, their fruit quality, what they have seen up to date? Ernie, this is Mark Hanrahan. Do you hear me? Yes, Mark, we can hear you. Did you happen to see the fourth row from the bottom halfway up where it was unpruned yesterday or today? Yes, I did. Did you see any elongation in fruit? Yes, I did. Do you think that was from hormones? Well, and that's why I asked uh, Stefano and, and Carolina because uh, what what I did today with that fruit, that it, it, it was elongated, but also we have an even elongation. So we had, we, I saw elongated fruit, but also the misshape. Um, and we cut all those fruits and we observed that they all have quite a big amount of uh, seeds. Uh, in general, two seeds per carpel. Um, so, I could not relate that to the uh, amount of seeds. And for me, it's still an unknown. I wouldn't know what, what could be causing that. Uh, this is a fourth leaf block. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you, if you can share, if, if you observe. So uh, this block, so what you, what you saw today was a fourth leaf cosmic crisp block G11 trained to a two liter system with strong influence from Stefano in doing click pruning. And in fact, this year uh, we click pruned again and he felt that that was not necessary if I remember correctly. Now on that fourth row you saw, you saw where we did not do any tapping because we forgot it. So that fruit had been click pruned previous summer as well, the whole orchard. So you saw fruit setting on long branches um, and the rest of the orchard, you saw that the fruit was set on, uh, on one of those sites, the previous summer click pruning. Does that make sense? You saw basically a tree drooping. Oh. So, Mark, you getting you cutting off a little bit, but I, I, I think that what you explaining here is that these trees that were showing more of this misshaped fruit were not click pruned this year, but they were the year before, right? They pruned this year. They were not pruned. Yeah, they were not pruned this year. Period. Correct. Yes. So I would like to make the point that when I observed the fruit today, I did not see a difference in terms of the misshape between one block or the other. But this would be, could be just an observation. And I think that if we want to relate that to the pruning or unpruned, we will need to go and collect a larger amount of samples to, to see if there is a correlation. But as a simple anecdote and just observing the rows and walking the rows, I did not see um, a big correlation between those 
trees that were pruned or not in terms of this misshaped fruit? Well, I don't think the shape was enough to call it. It just had an elongated calyx and where it had a kit at the end. And then you, and if we, I, I know that the percentage was higher with that e pronounced elongation in the unpruned section of the orchard. I thought maybe you'd saw that too. Maybe I'm wrong. We, we could follow up and make sure that I think it would be good. Yeah, get a count. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna read some of the, the information that I see here in the chat. Um, some people saw more mildew strikes later in the growing compared to other mildew susceptible varieties. They attribute it to their high, high vigor and how, how aggressively they continue to grow late in the season. So what I understand of this comment is that it might be more susceptible for those blocks that are with high vigor, right? As in any, any other apple variety probably. This is a, a comment that maybe Carolina, you can also see and, and talk about this, that um, last year they did not clip the stems of the small amount of fruit they harvested, and they did not see a significant amount of stem puncture. Is it being required to clip the stems this year? Or this is a question for Carolina and, and Jill probably. So Apple, um, in the 2020 quality standards, um, we are strongly recommending that a grower clips the stems. We can't use the word require, but we do strongly recommend because in larger operations, and, and as you allude, you, you do a lot of hand packing and, and had a small amount, and therefore I think the handling was maybe more gentle. Um, and so, um, in a larger operation where you're you know um, hauling the bins around you're um, tumbling across the lines we did find that the some of the stems that tend to be rather woody at the top um, did make punctures in the fruit which um, significantly increased college and even um, once if it was missed and got into the box it reduced the storability so we feel very strongly that this will make a significant decrease in college for a grower um, if he um, clips the stems. And so um, there is a, a study that Inez and her staff completed in 2018, I believe. It's on um, both the um, industry site and also WSU tree fruit, Re tree fruit site and the tree fruit research sites um, where you can um, look at the um, uh, at, at the study and see what they estimate your um, your impact financial impact would be for doing so. Bernie, we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so what are the pressures, the bricks and the starch um, for this year to ideally for harvesting? I have, I have posted a link with the recommended harvest criteria for this year. And so you can download it from, the, from our website um, and easy to read. Uh, last, last week I, I presented it, but it's very easy to follow uh, for this year harvest. And Ines is also sharing the recommendations. We've been sharing a folder with all the information for harvest. Ines is showing the red folder that we've been uh, delivering to growers. So if you haven't received this folder with the information, you can reach out to any of us, Ines, me, Carolina, uh, or Karen, and we can deliver those to you. 
I also um, have the quality standards um, that I can email to you. So I'll put my email address into the chat. And if you want to send me a note, I can email it to you as well. And so for harvest this year, we are using the Cosmic Crisp Starch Scale to help gauge when harvest should start. And um, for the 2020 crop year, we give you a range of 2 to 2.5 is the recommended um, uh, threshold for starch clearance that you should um, achieve before you start your harvest. And um, the starch scales are also available from in the packets that were mentioned as well as um, online. So um, if you need those tools, please reach out to us and we will make sure that you get some. Yeah, they're also all posted on the TreeFood Extension website. You can download all the material there. So there is the harvest criteria, the, 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 um, the criteria that Jill just mentioned. There is a defect guide posted there. The starch skills are posted there. And hard copies are available from all of us if you want them. So apart from that uh, question about the quality, there first I would like to ask if it's necessary to spray or apply any type of products for stop drop and if so uh, what will be the timing stefano do you have any experience with the stop drop in cosmic so we we normally don't see a huge amount of fruit dropping but uh, this year can be uh, probably early ripening so probably we are a few days earlier compared to probably other season and uh, i don't have any direct experience on on, on but if you are thinking about uh, uh, you know go a little bit longer with uh, with harvest probably you would be a, a option to try so but i have no data to share with anybody yeah yeah, and I don't know if there's any grower that have tried that and if he can share that experience. Uh, for me, the same that uh, Stefano just said, I don't have the experience. We haven't tried it. And actually, what I will, uh, and again, this is more like an anecdote that I, we think that the, this year the fruit is uh, very well attached to the stems. And I don't think Cosmic especially has a problem in dropping fruit before harvest. Uh, even with the winds that we have this year, we didn't have fruit drop in, in the block. We have actually trees that drop, but not fruit. Um, so I'm not so sure if that's necessary. Yeah, I can echo that. This is Ines. Um, in the last in the eight years that we observe Cosmic Crisp, uh, fruit drop, uh, pre-harvest fruit drop has never been a, an issue. Um, and so we, we didn't um, look at this. Um, I want to maybe encourage everybody. I know in the webinars you're muted and you cannot unmute yourself. This is not the case today. So you're very welcome to hit that mute button to unmute yourself and say something and to share with the group. It is also really important for us as a as a team uh, to hear if there's any problems or any questions or any things that you cannot figure out or you're not sure of. Um, so we can help uh, solve these problems together. Uh, we really want to make sure everybody has all the information uh, necessary to have a seamless harvest and hopefully has the optimum pack out. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself and say something if you want, or of course, post something in the chat box. So Stefano, you also touched base on the harvest time. You mentioned that uh, you feel that you going a little bit earlier than last year. The same thing we see in at the Rosa. We it seems that we are maybe even two weeks ahead of um, last year. Do you think? Do you anticipate what would be the harvest period for Washington? So is a, a, each area will have a, probably a, a different situation to deal with. So it's impossible to say something. But what, what I say is that uh, at least uh, today uh, we did starch and uh, we are around two. So and 
and this is the point. So this is what I can say. So this is uh, we are around two in um, in sunrise. So and uh, you 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 have to keep uh, you know going and check every <laughs> every three days uh, where where the starch is going because. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I feel that when the starch will be over, you know, 2.5 or something like that, between 2 and 2.5, you can, if you have enough color, you can. Big deal for the yeah. Yeah. Someone is picking. Yeah, someone is uh, <laughs> showing some <laughs> secrets there. <laughs> uh, we could, we can mute them if uh, if you can see who was that but anyway yeah. i would so, like but, to uh, go... just to say yeah but just yeah. to confirm so start is around <laughs> two we are not so far away from 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 starting and they say for me it's a little bit early this year compared yes uh, i i will agree and I, I see some heads saying that yeah it seems that it's, it's a bit early this year um there is a question here about if anyone had issues with the growth of, of making the leader to growth and having more growth in the laterals, so they become more uh, vigorous in the base of the tree with the laterals, but they cannot increase the growth on the top of the trees. And I will echo this this comment because uh, we have toured a couple of uh, orchards um, yesterday and there are a lot of situations where we can see that problem, that the trees are not reaching the top, they stop the growth and there's a lot of growth in the lateral shoot. I imagine this is a question for me. I suppose so. <laughs> so uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, the variety, and uh, to my understanding of this variety, have the tendency to lose the bottom very quickly. So if you are planning to go by axe, uh, don't crop fruit in the top part of your tree because you shut down immediately the growth of this variety. Okay, so this is the first point. Second, if you fill up the space very quickly, many times you can end up uh, with a lot of uh, blind wood. And at the same time, uh, you can have uh, one sheet of wood that is or even more that is not uh, producing the things. And, uh, and it's really depending what, what you want to do, because in my opinion, you have also to figure it out uh, that, that if you are growing like uh, a, um, a single stem with uh, a specific rootstock, you cannot grow two stem with this one without having a reduction of the vigor because the, the biax is done to reduce the vigor, not to increase the vigor. So of course, if you have a shallow soil and you go biax on a weak rootstock, you can have a situation like that. So, and in this case, probably you need to optimize uh, you know, uh, the, the fertigation or nutrient application or something like that, that, that can be, can be managed. But each situation is, uh, is, is peculiar. And another thing, if you got big complete term, you need to, 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 to remove that. So, and, and, and if you trim the lateral, then you, you can make the crop grow again. Of course, if you, if you have a kind of bushy tree at the bottom, of course, the top shut down. So, but um, again, so it's a kind of uh, um, situation where you can, you can manage uh, the tree in a different way. So it's, uh, uh, if, you, if you are in an area where you know that your tree are not growing, I never say to go by ax, you know, so uh, this is the point. So if, uh, if you are in an area where you, you, you have horsepower, not new grand or new land or something like that, uh, you can go easy by axe and be happy. So the other thing is how you build a fruit wall. So in this case, you have to probably change a little bit the vigor of the rooster if you are, if you, or uh, increase the level of uh, a nutrient like nitrogen and this kind of stuff. 
And it's also important which kind of tree you are starting with, okay? Because if you, you know, if you do your Biax, uh, uh, it, probably if you add back a tree, you can have a easy three, four feet of growth in the first year. And then you, you can decide what, where to go. Of course, there are some practices, uh, you know, that have to be optimized. So it's too generic. So depending where, where, where you are speaking about. Mm -hmm. I, is, is anyone want to share something I hear? Okay, so I do, I, I liked what you mentioned before, uh, Stefano, about the crop load. And uh, when we visit the growers uh, this week, uh, one thing that it was um, very distinctive is that those trees, because in the Yakima Valley, we probably struggle more with high vigor than low vigor. And, and in those trees that people were pruning during the winter, uh, because the only shoots that they are able to prune are in the base of the trees where you have laterals, in some cases they increase the vigor of, those, of that area. And uh, by not managing the top of the leader, they left a lot of fruit. And that really showed an impact, like you mentioned, Stefano, before, that by just leaving the, the leader that you want to grow up to the wire with fruit, that really stopped the growth of the tree. And anecdotally, there's a grower that had hail damage early in the season, so he had no fruit in his block. Uh, it's a block that is uh, very shallow, uh, where he didn't have much growth on the third leaf. Um, but this year, because he had no fruit in the orchard, the growth of that leader really took off and it had a very good vigor in the top of the tree. So I will echo Stefano that to manage that crop load, especially in the leader where you want that uh, to get to the top of the wire, uh, to remove those fruit or, or blooms to encourage that growth, uh, apical growth. In, so I'm going to go to the, the fruit quality, go back to the fruit quality. How much sunburn will be allowed before it is considered a cull? Jill, probably this is for you. Well, so we're still very early in our marketing launch. Our goal in the early years for Cosmic Crisp is to gain as much following and consumer loyalty as we possibly can. We know that we had a rather small amount of fruit last year. We had fabulous success. People, ever since we stopped uh, shipping fruit in the early spring, um, social media and the websites are full of people, consumers wanting to know when there's gonna be fruit again in their stores. We are, um, planning, I mean, this year we'll probably have about four times as much fruit as we had last year. So we want to uh, reach out into more areas of the United States with that fruit, as well as we want to put fruit into some of our export markets. But we know that in the years following, we are going to have more and more fruit, and we're going to need to be able to find a good place to market it. If we allow um, our boxes at this stage of the game to kind of push the envelope with defects, we're going to do ourselves and our future selves a huge disservice. So we have, since the wind event, as they said, Cosmic Chris didn't necessarily fall from the tree, but it did um, get bruised and it probably gained some, uh, some limb rubs and other skin markings. And so there have been some inquiries as did we plan to add a utility grade this year? The answer to that is no. We want to continue to put up the best product that we can and continue to gain fans and to get people to buy the apple over and over and over again. If we allow too much into the pack, we're going to 
we're going to, uh, you know, affect our chances of being successful in the future. So we are, instead of allowing the utility grade, our goal is to find more opportunities for you to use your, sell those products to secondary market opportunities, whether it be a juice or a cider or the slicers. We're um, making, um, negotiated with companies to do co-branded products. So they're selling a Cosmic Crisp branded product to the consumer and trying to place that product outside of, not only the produce department, but in other areas around the store. So where I'm going with this is that we have, we, we, we adhere to the grade standards for Washington State. We don't have a private grade, but we do, you know, and, and yes, there are some tolerances. Some of it may get into the box, but our goal is to be, especially in the top grade, as clean as possible. Um, we are asking for and got a very high price last year. We want to continue that, but if we, if we get sloppy, people won't pay for that. So I, I know that's hard to hear. I know it's been, it's been rough in, in some um, instances this year, but, but we really feel that for the future of the Apple and for the long-term success, we need to continue to, to do what we've been doing and continue to put up a, a, a nice pack. Um, the other thing I need to mention is um, last year we received some um, information that some growers had um, purchased their culls back from their warehouses in order to sell them at farm gate. And that is also a practice that we really can't allow. Um, farm gate, you, you make a choice when you buy your trees. Are you going to sell commercially or are you going to sell farm gate? There, there isn't the opportunity to do both. So, um, we got complaints from, from people who saw the fruit at Farmgate last year that, that had tended to be not very pretty. It looked pretty banged up. And so even Farmgate has to adhere to a minimum of a U.S. fancy grade. So that fruit still needs to be fairly well formed and when it's in tall and, and clean and free from injuries, free from defects that are going to detract from the grade. There's a tolerance, yes, but the whole box can't look that way. So I, I know I'm probably making some people unhappy by saying these things, but um, if you have a commercial license, you need to um, sell your fruits through the commercial avenues, which is either your warehouse or the, um, the um, processor purchasers. And then again, if you have a farm gate license, your avenue is fruit stands and farm markets. Um, I, I know that that is, you know, maybe not exactly what a lot of people want to hear, but um, it's what we need to do for now. And it's what we need to do to be successful long term. So Jill, what should we do if we see that uh, fruit on the roadside? That, and so if you, you see something that you are, you know, suspicious of or uh, that maybe it is not meeting grade, um, you can reach out to um, PBM, myself, um, Dylan, uh, uh, Dylan Hudson is um, our, <laughs> our Apple cop, I guess. <laughs> he goes and he investigates the um, uh, licensing uh, discrepancies or, or um, issues. And, and so, you know, again, but our, our goal is to educate. So we're not going to go out and, and blast someone. We're going we're gonna to investigate. We're going to find the facts. We're going to speak to them about it and try to make a correction that way. Um, because, you know, we are, after all, all an industry together. We need to work together. So if everybody plays their part, I think we'll, we'll do well. Thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. Is there any question from the growers that it seems uh, a bit quiet? Um, if there's no more questions, I will uh, go ahead and ask about uh, observations of defects and or disorders that we have seen on pre-harvest. Um, opening the question for the growers.
I'm not so sure Carolina or Ines um, or Jill, maybe if you have visited some orchards and if you see any distinctive uh, condition for this year, um, to this point, I, don't, I have not seen the greasiness, but I don't think we have the maturity yet to, to be able to say something about that for this year. What I have seen in, in some orchards that are young orchards, well, all the orchards probably are very young in the state, but I have seen some green spot. Um, there are blocks that have non-green spot, others that have uh, visually uh, quite a bit of green spot. So Stefano, would you like to add to the conversation what you've been um, researching on in relation to green spot and observation this far, what we know? Um, I have been supported by the commission uh, for a grant and um, I'm doing a study, specific study on determining the the onset of the green spot. So when the onset is appearing over the fruit and um, where to start, uh, what can be the metabolite involved in this uh, situation. So, and uh, we are harvesting the project now. I just came back from, <laughs> from the field uh, three minutes before the meeting. So, and, um, and we have a, a quite a large amount of fruit uh, with green spot. And um, that I see some difference right now in, in among the two rootstock that I'm between the two rootstock that I'm using, and um, and uh, this is what I can say because uh, I need to have more data to speak. So I right now there are a lot of uh, things going on. So everybody got a kind of theory or something like that. Uh, everybody's looking for a solution, but uh, you know, so when you have the, the data that speak, then you can comment. Uh, what we know for sure is that, uh, like we say uh, last time, so if you want to see where the symptoms start, uh, normally is in the upper part of the fruit close to the peduncle. So in some cases inside the, the cavity and you see that it's coming out, going down. And, um, and it's quite, uh, 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 there are several levels. So we grade the, the intensity of the symptom that appears first on the peel and then, and then in, in the pulp when they become really severe. So, but um, the onset, uh, the, the visible symptoms this year for us was around August 8. Uh, but we saw something coming a little bit earlier. So we are trying to see if it's possible to identify uh, the, the, the onset uh, before we see the symptoms. So because it's kind of uh, important point. So what, what is the distrigging? Uh, you know the, the 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 appearance of the of the symptoms. So, but we are harvesting the experiment right now, so it's too early to to say anything. So, more than that, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I agree. We we still don't don't have that much information. I I could share with you all that we've been. This is the second. This will be the third season, but we haven't harvested yet, but we did at least two years so far in the Rosa where we have a high incidence of green spot in one of the systems, which is the spindle or initially it was like a bending type of system, which is more vigorous compared to the other system. And we do see more incidence of green spot um, definitely in the ones that are more vigorous. We also observe more incidence of green spot um, in the G41 compared to the M9 NIC29. In our blog, which I have to mention that our blog is a, is a very fertile blog. It has a silt loam soil. Um, so it's not a sandy 
sandy soil uh, like the one that is in, in sunrise. Uh, we evaluated the nutrient balance between the green spot fruit and the non and the healthy fruit. And consistently in the peel, we observed that the levels of nitrogen and uh, potassium were higher in those fruit that show the green spot. And it was uh, in some cases that difference was also shown in the pulp. Um, but it wasn't as consistent as uh, the analysis with the peel. So in the peel, the green spot fruit had always more nitrogen and in, and in two years it has more potassium and also more magnesium. So the balance between these macronutrients with calcium was uh, consistently higher for the ones that show the green spot in either their G41 and M9s. And so in addition to research, we are, I am working with Karen and Inez to help define green spot and provide, and, and Carolina to provide, define it, um, had, add photography, um, so there's the severe category which reaches into the pulp or the flesh and that is categorized as serious damage and therefore should be called. Um, if there's no broken skin, it's uh, a surface type um, green spot that is just um, kind of resi resides on the, on the peel. Um, some of that could get into the pack but you know, one incident of is makes the apple categorize as damage. So if you have quite a lot of it, you know, it, it, it quickly bounces up against the tolerances. So some of it does color over and if it's not, you know, as visible, then more of it will be getting, will go into the pack. But, but again, it's something that we want to um, um, watch carefully because we, we want to put up a pack that, that is, um, that is, is fairly clean. Thank you, Jill. And I, I would also like to add that um, uh, the Rosa is not an example of a commercial situation. As you all know, it was a research uh, project, but because we have their M9s and, and G41, we still are able to see the difference between those two rootstocks. Uh, the absolute values might not reflect what we expect to have in a commercial situation. And just to add, uh, to have a reference in the BIAX, where we have the probably the most uh, similar condition to a commercial condition in, in our block. In the BIAX, we had last year, we had 1% of green spot in the M9s, and we had 18% of green spot in the G41. And so those values might, might be more uh, similar to what you will expect in, an, in a, a commercial situation. With both, I would like to add this because I think it's relevant with both a very similar crop load. So Jill, do, do the prices seem like they will be similar to last year? Do we have an idea of the prices? Um, well, my crystal ball is a little bit blurry, but um, I know that the marketing team, although our role is uh, primarily to be the consumer uh, launch, we, we spend most of our time marketing to the consumer and informing and got, gaining excitement. Um, we have, um, the marketing team has spent quite a bit of time working with the major retailers around the United States, talking to them about, um, you know, the crop size, what's upcoming, and um, just their observations from this contact with, with the large retailers say that they were happy with the way uh, the prices went last year and, and for an all intents and purposes, they plan to start off where they did last year. Okay. 
So now moving to the harvest for this season, I think that for us, uh, especially probably for Carolina, it would be very helpful that we can gather information from the growers, the different sites. Um, Carolina, could you comment of uh, what we should be looking at harvest, what to measure, how to measure, and, and, and guidelines of what you would like to um, collect from growers to inform? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think it, we, Ines and I, uh, put together this recommendation of for harvest criteria this year, and they're pretty simple and good to follow. And I'm just going to um, summarize some of that. Um, you don't want to harvest fruit below two. I mean, that is uh, to keep the flavor, uh, development of flavor afterwards. Uh, you need to go beyond two. So we're, we're early, but uh, as uh, Stefano said, uh, from now on, if you're on two, you just have to um, try to get sample, uh, samples every two or three days until you reach a little bit higher than that. Now, the starch index that we are recommending for RA um, within four months of post-harvest post storage, short CA also uh, from you know up to four months of storage, it's between two and 4.5. So you do have a wide range um, and you can harvest within that range, not below two, now beyond not beyond 4.5 because the variety at least last year was you know the greasiness was an issue and the other thing that happens if you harvest too late you are going to have more stem ball cracking bird damage and definitely greasiness and that is going to reflect on lower uh, higher cold percentages and in, in lower packouts um, that the starch index is up to now the most the the, the most important index uh, maturity index that we're using on this variety. Ines can can comment on that um, and firmness. You know you can you know we have a big range too, uh, but it's all the same for all purposes. Uh, what do you want to do? Store uh, short term, mid term, and even long term. Uh, so 16 to 23 pounds would be a, a big range on firmness that you want to look into it. Now, if you're going to do long-term CA, we are recommending uh, one MCP applications just to reduce uh, greasiness. We are not sure today um, what are the climate uh, and weather conditions that will lead to higher greasiness. Um, because it is a multifactorial event on susceptible variety, and this is susceptible. So if you harvest late, and we also, and if you, we have certain climate prior harvest, uh, we are going to, the, the fruit is going to develop more greasiness. Um, we are not having hot, you know, weather right now, which is good uh, for reducing the speed of maturity of the fruit. Uh, so it should be okay, but we never know. We're going to see at the end of the storage period how did it go with the greasiness. Now, um, if you apply 1MCP, you're going to reduce uh, production of greasiness on the fruit, and so you will be okay for long-term storage. Um, so we are recommending that. The other thing that it's, it's a pretty easy variety to store, so 32, 33 Fahrenheit would be, it's going to be good. We also have in that sheet a uh, control atmosphere recommendation, 1% CO2, 2% oxygen had work in the past. Enes did that research and she can comment a little bit more on that. Um, I don't know what else. Enes, do you have anything else? Yeah, I would say one of the things to uh, keep in mind is um, definitely uh, plan on applying a pre-harvest fungicide or post-harvest fungicide um, because of the splits to make sure you're um, controlling uh, for molds and storage. Um, that's definitely something um, that we that we would recommend on top of, of everything uh, else. Um, I would say in regards to firmness, this apple can be very firm but it depends on the year of where the starting level is of the firmness. So you basically want to have seen some decrease in your firmness level. 
some years you start basically at 25, so you want to go down to at least 23. Some years you start at 22, 21, and then you go down a little bit to um, 19, 18. Um, that's why there is a range given. We would love to get feedback uh, in case we're off with the values, because of course, most of these values are based on uh, some, only some orchards uh, uh, in, that we have used for research. So the commercial conditions could, there could be the range could be a lot different. So we, we really would like to get your feedback. I would uh, like to also encourage everybody when you do take your starch samples to please make sure you're not sampling uh, damaged fruit, especially not uh, sunburned fruit that will give you a different reading. Um, that, that fruit will always be more mature. Well, this in general is not a problem. It's just gonna over exaggerate how, how ripe your fruit is in general on the tree. I think that those are my additional comments um, to Carolina's. And, um, and then I, I would say, um, my question would be, what are people planning on doing? Just doing one pick or two picks? Um, what, what is it that everybody's doing? We would be really curious to see in our experience, this, this variety lends itself to a one pick variety, but we're, yeah, we are curious to see what ultimately penetrates into the industry and what people end up doing. Because we saw some differences last year um, in maturation patterns and what practical was, was necessary. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ines and, and Carolina. Um, so there is a, a question here about what should we do with the culls? Uh, should we remove them at harvest? Jill is saying yes, but we can't hear you, but I, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to I mean, that's, that's a tough question. I, I, <laughs> um, uh, I don't think you should do anything different than you normally do. You know, you should, I mean, if you have stem bowl splits that are deep and extend over the shoulders, if you have green spot that has caused it's into the skin and you know that has an open wound, that's one thing. But I, I, I hesitate in being, you know, the one to tell you how much to remove in the field. That's, that's, that's a personal call. Um, like I said, we're doing what we can to give you avenues to sell your calls, um, but um, that's that's got to be kind of your decision on on you know where where's your um, financial um, you know point of level for for that. Sorry, <laughs> that's a tough one. Yeah, I I think it's a tough one, Carolina. Can you comment maybe also in the, you have a lot of experience with the sun scald and, and sunburn, what level, because there is a level that is very mild that we might not detect when we are harvesting, but what effects you, we have in storage with that fruit and how can we manage that so we don't end up with a bad quality fruit after storage? Well, um, the, the cold analysis I, I did last year, we did with a group, uh, was pretty good. I mean, fruit, uh, very high percentage of packouts, and so very small percentages of coals. Uh, of course, we did see some sunburn on those coals, but they, that wasn't the first, you know, the main problem with the variety. It was mechanical damage, including um, stem, stem punctures and other type of punctures and limb rubbing. So definitely uh, sunburn wasn't an issue after storage. Now, how much fruit, uh, sunburn fruit and even green spot was left in the orchard? That's another, another type of analysis that we didn't do. Um, so, but in general, uh, sunburn that is mild sunburn, it goes into the box. It does go into the box, um, and and as Ines said, if you measure firmness on the fruit that has a mild sunburn, it will be firmer uh, compared to the other side of the apple and apples that do not have sunburn at all. 
So, um, so yeah, but that's why sometimes, you know, the, the, the general recommendation for apples is to take pressure on both sides of the apples, opposite sides, and um, you, can, you can just repeat a third measurement if you're off in more than 1.5 pounds between those two measurements. And that actually takes care of the differences of the sun exposed side of the fruit in the, in the shade side of the fruit, the other side. So, um, so that, that would be like general. So in general, also you keep the fruit that has visible, moderate or severe sunburn stays in the orchard. It doesn't go into the cold, uh, the post harvest or it doesn't get harvest even. Uh, because if you're paying for for cold storage with that fruit, you might as well leave what it, you know it's a call already, and you don't you don't take it to the packing house. So it's just a general you know observation on on apples really. Um, now I didn't see sunscalds if if that was the question. Um, we did see you know some browning on on the skin. Uh, of very little percentage, and we actually have it in our in our report. Um, but it's I didn't see that it was related to sun exposure or sun damage. So I'm not sure. You know, it yeah. we'll see in the future. Yeah, I that think goes. that this year, Carolina, probably is going to be a good year to evaluate. Last year. Uh, that we put the netting also the rosa we didn't have any uh, hot weather compared to this year so i guess last year wasn't a, a big problem for growers and i have seen some sunburn damage uh, in young orchards not in everywhere but uh, especially those ones that don't have uh, a system to protect like overhead cooling or or netting yeah absolutely <laughs> And in those cases, sometimes you can see that, and we have an example on that, of that in the defect guide. Uh, you can have this um, water core type um, situation or the water soaked tissue right under the skin. And that's really typical for what you describe, a young orchard that had some sun damage, then that's what, what develops. Um, and I would also like to add something related to other the, the other maturity parameters I would say while this is not like um like again while this is not a clear number we do re have in the recommendations that the bricks level should be above 11 and that is also related to the ultimate flavor if you're below uh, 11 at harvest uh, your fruit is just not going to be very sweet um, at all so you would want to aim that you have at least 11 um, and that's normally not a problem. There's a lot of cosmic crisps that are at 14 or 15, but there's some locations that where, where the sugars take a little longer to build up. I would definitely recommend that. Um, again, looking at the flavor and looking at the overall really good and ac not just good, fantastic eating experience. Um, and so you wanna maybe look for that as well and let us know if you have problems reaching that um, 11, um, because we would like to know about that. And Ines, uh, probably for you too, if we haven't touched on, on this question, the question is how much drop in pressure should we be looking at before harvest? Yeah, typically you have a drop of 20% in pressure from when, if you start three weeks before harvest then you can expect about 20% drop in pressure. So that would be like if you start at 25, you then would be at 20, something like that. Um, maybe 25% drop in pressure. So that's, that's what you can expect. Not a lot, not a ton uh, of drop. And then it'll stay really stable. In storage, you can actually, there is uh, very little uh, firmness lost in storage. So it's, you can almost say whatever goes in comes back out. Um, you, um, the apple stays very firm in storage. And I would um, uh, mention also hard green background. That is something that we emphasized in this year's um, marketing and quality standards. Um, if the back, it, Cosmic Crisp is a bicolored apple. We've been quite lucky. It seems to qual, uh, color very easily and color very darkly. But um, this year, if this is a more difficult coloring year, you're going to see more of the bicolored um, characteristics come out in the fruit. 
and the background color should be breaking green to yellow. It should not be hard green. If you start tasting your fruit, you'll notice that you'll find a more bitter and maybe unpleasant taste. We think that that might be related to the green background and, and a, you know, a, a lack of ripeness. So um, watch, watch your background colors. Yeah, so uh, just to add to, before I forget to what you mentioned before, Ines, about the, the um, maturity, how homogeneous is in the tree, I, I will uh, agree with you when you said that if you have a very balanced tree in a system that has good light interception throughout the whole tree, we, we observe, and this is the case for the biax at the rosa, that and, and other growers that have a system that is very well controlled, the maturity can be very um, even throughout the whole tree. But we have also seen uh, sites where we don't have that balance in vigor and where you have more, like I mentioned before, we have more vigor in the base of the, of the trees. And so that area also gets more shaded and it doesn't acquire the color um, at this point. And so we do see a difference in, in the color at least uh, throughout the tree, which can also translate to maturity. So I, I will wonder and I will um, ask the growers to, uh, to let us know if, if, if picking in different timing will be something that can be considered in those situations. Although I will always encourage that you try to manage that bigger first. <laughs> Is there anything else that uh, you would like to discuss, Carolina, that you would like to add, Stefano, Jill, or Ines, uh, any advice for the growers or, or follow-up questions that uh, we would like to um, consider for the growers so we get more information? Well, maybe Stefano can comment a little bit about because uh, he 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 did talk last week about the um, harvest window. I I think it will be useful. Yeah, sure. So, uh, for for let let do something like that. If you if you give me a minute, so I want to do. Uh, I can show some slide about uh, the project. And, uh, and this will help probably everybody to, but, but I need to recover. So while you another question and yeah. then the presentation. Yeah, yeah. while uh, Stefano tries to uh, share the screen, uh, there's two questions here. One is uh, what would be a good bird control? And, and probably th there's a lot of growers in this meeting that maybe can share their experience of what has worked uh, in the past for bird control. This is a very tasty fruit apparently and birds love it. And we've seen some bird damage early early on. And the second question um, is about the trip damage, uh, if that will ever color up. And for my experience, it does, does not color up. The trip damage uh, doesn't get to color up. I agree, it doesn't color up. So one of the comments here in the chat is the use of laser that it has worked for bird control. I would also like to comment in terms of bird damage. Um, we have data that shows, and Stefano has data as well, that shows there's more bird damage as the fruit hangs on the tree longer. While we do in general say it has a long harvest window and typically the starch movement will also plateau for about three weeks. Um, once you reach the 3.5 to 4.5 on the starch scale, you will start typically picking up more um, 
more splits and more bird packs, more and more and more, and that will diminish ultimately your um, your yields. So one way to it's not really controlling birds, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, while while you have some room and while you, you're not in a super big rush to get the fruit off the tree, there is a limit to it. At some point, uh, you you will have a lot of calls due to bird packs um, if you hang, let the fruit hang on the tree too long. Yeah, so I I can put some data on uh, uh, Ines just to validate what you what you say. So they did the mm -hmm. the harvest window trial. That oops. We go back here, okay. Uh, the windows harvest trial that we did last year, uh, six peak, uh, one early, one really late, uh, and, and four in between. And uh, we start um, September 17 and, and September 24. You see that from 1.4, we, we arrived 2.2, and then 3.3, 3.3, 3.3, quite stable there. And, um, and and those things here, so from pick two, pick three, pick four, at least it seems to be the, the three weeks uh, where you can uh, have a, a, an optimum uh, um, situation. So the one thing that we notice, uh, then if you pick too early, uh, you can have a, a reduction in the, in the caliper of the fruit, in the sides. Uh, and... Um, uh, this was the situation of uh, last week uh, when the tree shut down. Uh, I didn't upgrade the, 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 the data of this one, but that is what uh, Ines was referring. So um, the, this one is really what is important that you notice. So pick five and six, the increase here was largely due to uh, split and bird. So this is really the, the point. So if you if you see here the, the 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 compromise between the fruit size and uh, and the amount of fruit that you need to go is uh, pick two, three, and four. And uh, and here, honestly, you you have a lot of split, and the bird uh, become really aggressive. This year, I can say that at least in our location, bird was very aggressive. We start to see first uh, damage in in in. in end of July, so very early. So, and, uh, and now they're very aggressive. And this is what I was uh, mentioning as well, like uh, everybody say before, especially Ines, uh, you can see that uh, you got the degradation of starch and it's quite constant here. So it doesn't mean that the fruit is always the same. Uh, uh, it just means that um, the starch is the same but the, the ripening is, uh, is quite uh, evolving in this case. And when you are here, um, all those facts that, uh, that the fruit split is also related to the high amount of dry matter that we analyzed last time, so last week, and uh, uh, the optimal range would be 14 to uh, 18. Uh, uh, when it's very high and need to be in, in a young orchard, so you can have a, 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 an, an impact of the dry matter that can be over 19 and then become really difficult to, for the consumer uh, have an enjoyable experience when they are eating the fruit because it's very hard to buy, at least in our condition. And uh, yeah, so this is what, um, what we mentioned last time that probably everybody now that was not able to, to attend the last week can see uh, today. So this is uh, what we have. So that more or less is just confirming what the Carolina and, and Ines was telling you before. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, we are at 4.30, but there, there is a question here that just came in. Uh, did any grower notice a distinctive yellow flesh hue in cosmic at harvest? It seems that last year, most of the fruit were received at crunch pack for slicing had yellowish flesh, which is a problem for, for them, for crunch pack. So any idea why there is this variation in flesh coloration?
it's very untypical. It's very, um, very unusual situation. So that would be very interesting if other people are starting to see this. Um, we have uh, not seen it in any of the batches of fruit that we that run that we ran across. Uh, that you had this dark yellow flesh color is is super unusual. Um, so um, it's a it's a puzzle. So if anybody else sees that, please let uh, let any of us know. Yes. Yeah, I, I, sorry, Bernadita. I have a comment about one question that I saw in the chat about the trip damage, and uh, uh, the 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 person that made the comment is exactly right. So trip this year, they we saw damage very early in the fruit, and and they are really a white mark that is uh, stay there. So we have, we, we saw all the damage that are still there. So yeah. I don't know how, how Jill will consider this kind of uh, damage too, but uh, uh, normally they are not large, but you see the, the white uh, spot in the, in the fruit, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, there was also another question here on the, uh, on the color, on the color standards, Jill, that you can probably take on just to make sure everybody's clear on that. Just want to make sure you unmute yourself. <laughs> it yelled at me. <laughs> um, so um, I'm assuming that you mean color standard in relation to grade. And so last year we set our commercial grade splits um, for Washington Extra Fancy at 50% to full. Now, I know that's quite a wide range. So within that um, range, we encourage the warehouses to segment that um, to give a box presentation that is consistent. And, um, you know, some customers will take a Washington Extra Fancy with a little less color. Some are, you know, very um, adamant that they must have full color. So, you know, you take your 50% your to full color and you, you chop it up maybe three times and you have three Washington Extra Fancy grades. For reporting purposes, it all comes back into one Washington Extra Fancy grade. The um, Washington Fancy is 30% to 50% uh, good red color versus we say, um, um, for Washington Extra Fancy, we use the term um, uh, good, yeah, full, full, good red color. And then for Washington Fancy, um, red color. So in the fancy, you'll see the more cherry colors, possibly more, you know, um, obviously more bicolor. Um, and then in regards to thrip, um, yeah, if it's if it's a, a small marking that's kind of unobtrusive, that's one thing. If you get a larger one, you know it'll um, it'll it'll um, it, that that I guess I need to, I'll I'll talk to um, the uh, inspection service, Washington Inspection Service, to see um, if it's counted against color since it typically is white. Um, but um, but generally it, it it it's a defect, and so it's um, it it needs to fall within the tolerances. Thank you, Jill. And now we are four minutes, minutes past. I thank you everybody for your uh, participation in the chat mostly uh, and live to Mark Hanrahan, the one that participated live. Uh, we really like to encourage the discussion. We are all learning together. And next week, we're going to have the WOS38 Packer Shipper Q&A that we encourage you to join if you are part of the packing process. Uh, we also, this meeting is going to be recorded. And what we can do is to submit this video as a recording, but also we can add uh, the links for the resources that we discussed today. Thank you, everybody, and hope to see you next week.